So, um, hello everybody that we've got online and welcome to the MDC Connects webinar series. Um, I'm Sarah Brockbank, I'm a lead scientist at Medicines Discovery Catapult and I'm hosting this session today with my colleague Dan Bond. Um, this is the first in a series of weekly webinars that we're going to be running every Wednesday at 2pm and um, that's 2pm BST for anyone that is um, calling in outside the UK. gone too far down. So today is the first in a series of what we hope are nine informative drug discovery sessions and each of them is delivered by experts at the Medicines Discovery Catapult and our CRO network partners. Um, each of the sessions is going to focus on an aspect of preclinical drug discovery from today, um, selection of the right target, identifying a hit and optimising the compound through PK, PD and disease models, to safety and defining biomarker strategy. In this first session, um, we're thinking about identifying the target and I'd like, like to welcome two speakers to this. Firstly, David Gianni, who's Associate Director of Functional Genomics at AstraZeneca. And David is going to give a perspective from Big Pharma on the importance of selecting the right target. And secondly, John Overington, our Chief Informatics Officer here at Medicines Discovery Catapult. And he was going to talk about target identification using informatics and data mining. Just a point on this, we will take questions at the end of each presentation. And if you wish to ask a question, please type these in and you can do this at any time while they're giving the presentation. We use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screens and David and John will address them at the end of each of their talks. So without further ado, over to you, David. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, let me see if I can share this now. Can you let me know whether you can see the presentation? I can see that, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, I was saying thanks for, for the opportunity to be here today and uh, to provide some of the thinking around, um, around target discovery, identification of novel targets, um, uh, and to share some of the, of the, of the, of the thinking that we, um, uh, and, and the, the thinking around, around this space um, um, from, um, from an AstraZeneca perspective. Um, the presentation outline will be the following. I will provide a little bit of a, of a preamble of why I personally believe that target discovery is important, um, not only for a large, large pharma, but um, for, 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 for people that are interested in, um, in identification of novel targets in elucidation of new biology. Um, the, starting from this, I will, I will provide a little bit um, some insight into um, various target discovery platforms that we have invested in and built in AstraZeneca, um, working very collaboratively, I have to say, with, uh, with, with external bodies, with, with um, um, CROs and, and, uh, and, uh, and other academic groups. Um, and I will provide a project example, so I guess uh, uh, um, an example of uh, a functional genomic screen, as we call it, um, that um, um, is really providing for us um, a lot of, uh, uh, of enthusiasm and excitement around uh, the, the potential of what really target discovery platform can deliver for, uh, for drug discovery. So um, going forward, uh, why is target discovery important? And this, for me, is a very important question that is important. I guess it's worthwhile to spend a little bit of time um, uh, on. Um, and, and for me, it really goes back to the reason why drug fail in, in drug discovery. 
um, AstraZeneca, not only AstraZeneca, a number of other um, in industrial and non-industrial group have spent a lot of time here analyzing uh, um, why um, drug project uh, fails. Um, obviously, drug discovery is a costly business, and so understanding the root cause of where um, the project failed is very, very important. Um, we have, have run our own analysis, and, and I think from, from our perspective, um, um, I guess the, the angle for us was um, understanding what was the um, success of the implementation of a of a framework, a new way of working that um, um, was uh, put in place in AstraZeneca around 2011, 2012, um, that focused really on trying to work on the right targets and 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 then and, and from from these the the, the name 5R framework. Um, what, what the analysis uh, tells us is that this, um, the, 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 the framework is actually improving the success rate. We go from success rate of 4% of in 2010 to a su success rate of uh, 19% um, um, in 2016. So it's a significant improvement. Um, but when you focus on um, why still we see lack of efficacy, specifically for drug projects in the, in the so-called discovery phase, from, from target selection all the way to is one phase two um, clinical trial. Um, you can see these uh, these data normalized on the on the right curtain. Um, you, uh, I think, I think, I think the analysis is quite striking. It shows that uh, we're still failing um, pretty much for uh, a lack of efficacy. Um, while we are minimized, I guess the reason for failure in other areas such as chemistry, strategy, or or, or safety. What does it really mean that the project fails for lack of efficacy um, when entering uh, uh, clinical trials? It really, well, there, there are a number of, of sub-causes, I guess, if you want, um, grouped under um, a lack of clinical efficacy. Um, from a discovery perspective, I think an important point that I like to focus on is the fact that uh, um, very often, uh, um, a lack of clinical efficacy it can be recondu reconducted in some way to um, ineffective target validation. The target that we've chosen to work on and spend a lot of um, time working on producing molecules um, um, wasn't really a target that was um, whose inhibition was efficacious in, in a clinical settings. And this, to me, gives us a lot of insight on the fact that uh, um, an effective target discovery uh, a platform, an effective um, a target discovery um, uh, a framework um, is critical to reduce this attrition rate that we observe in the clinic. Um, and, and I guess moving forward, uh, the, 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 next, the next question is what does really make a good drug target from, uh, from, from an, uh, um, a drug discovery perspective, at least based on, on our experience? And even here, I think AstraZeneca and, and uh, um, a number of other groups have spent a um, lot of time uh, um, trying to, to, to reconnect uh, the cause of uh, uh, failure based on, on, on their own pipeline, um, uh, uh, specifically in the target validation uh, space. As you can see from, from this analysis, um, I think, um, I guess from, from my perspective, the learning from that, that I take from looking at these papers is that very often um, uh, the, the lack of a, a target linkage to disease, um, a genetic linkage to disease specifically, and the, the availability of uh, uh, um, biological models that can be employed in target discovery, but also in so-called target prosecution, and so everything that, that follows um, uh, a target selection, um, are critical features that are associated with, uh, um, with, uh, with, uh, with the problems that we observe in terms of clinical efficacy. And so um, um, when we started thinking about target discovery in AstraZeneca, we really use the genetic linkage to disease um, and the um, trying to build um, translatable uh, cellular models um, as, 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 I guess, the, the two driving pillars, the two dri driving concepts in, uh, in building our target discovery uh, engine. Um, and these are two things, two themes, I guess, that, that will recur a lot throughout the, the presentation. Um, so, uh, switching up a little bit gears, then what, um, 
what, what, what are from a strategic point of view the investments that we've done in AstraZeneca to um, build an efficient target discovery platform to reduce the clinical uh, uh, um, attrition rate. Um, these are just some of the initiatives uh, uh, that, that I have the time yet to summarize. There is a lot more obviously underneath these. Um, and this is really a mix of um, internal build that you see on the, on the left and a number of external collaboration that, that we have initiated with um, what we believe are key uh, uh, players in this field. Um, uh, because I'm absolutely conscious of the fact that, that, that an efficient target discovery platform is not something that one builds on its own in isolation, but it's, it's really um, a dialogue um, with, uh, with, um, with people that are active in this field. Um, and in, in the presentation, I will um, focus a little bit on uh, trying to explain a little bit at least these three um, strategic initiatives that we have initiated um, um, a few years back uh, in, uh, in target discovery. Um, I'll start with uh, the collaboration that we've started with um, the uh, IGI, the um, a, a Institute of, of Genomic, um, the, the Innova Innovative Genomics Institute, um, led by Jennifer Durda and, and, uh, and, and, and our collaborator in, um, in this, co in this um, uh, partnership, Luke Gilbert, is really um, an expert in applying um, uh, um, different modality of CRISPR screening um, to um, answer specific biological question. Um, and I guess going back to the key guiding principles um, that we um, um, that we take as, a, I guess as a inspirational principles for in building our platform, um, working with DIMS really has been uh, uh, very important for us because it's given us the possibility to um, deeply characterize the models that were used um, for screening in, in particular area of, um, uh, um, of I guess, cancer uh, research specifically in, uh, in the DNA damage response space. Um, this is an ongoing collaboration was initiated um, uh, uh, back in 2016 and, and then uh, renewed more recently. The other initiative, the other external partnership that I wanted just to um, spend some time talking about is uh, a partnership that was announced um, but um, in, in 2018, back end of 2018, it was really launched in September 2019. And it's a joint partnership with, between AstraZeneca and CIUK around the creation of a functional genomic center in Cambridge um, as, a, as a world leading center um, to perform pool CRISPR screening. Um, once again, I don't have the time here to go in a lot into the details of this modality of screening, but this is one of the, the, the key modalities, I guess, um, to, um, to perform CRISPR screening and um, specifically in the oncology space to identify novel mechanism of, um, of resistance um, to create new cancer medicines. Um, this is not the only thing that this, this, this um, center does. Um, the reason, and I'll go into, into, into one extra slide of detail around this, the reason why, um, well, I guess one of the key um, uh, aims of this, uh, of, this pro of this collaboration is also um, to, I guess, identify novel uh, models uh, and novel computational approaches that can, um, that can be used to perform pool CRISPR screening. Because at the moment, this modality of screening has really uh, been very successful in delivering uh, novel target hypotheses, but primarily using uh, 2D models. Going back to what I was saying before, this is, this is probably the present, but it's not gonna be the future for, for a target discovery platform. And so um, for us partnering with, the, with, the, with our colleagues at CIUK, it was really a great opportunity to um, get, a, um, um, get more insights into um, an extensive network of scientists um, with, a, with a solid drug discovery pipeline, with deep expertise into cancer biology and cancer biology models that could be potentially, uh, um, I guess, used synergistically with the expertise that we have in AstraZeneca in terms of uh, um, screening uh, um, and, and small molecule drug discovery. The last um, platform that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is the internal build that we have um, invested in, uh, in AstraZeneca with the formation of a so-called fun functional discovery uh, 
functional genomics group, um, which, um, which, which is a team, a group of people in AstraZeneca, in discovery sciences, um, uh, that, um, that employs a number of uh, different screening modalities that you see summarized at very high level in this slide on the, on the right cartoon, um, to interrogate the biology, once again, of disease-relevant models. Um, uh, as, um, as indicated in this slide, we still use small molecule um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way to um, interrogate a biology of, uh, of specific models. Although small molecule-based phenotypic screen in, in the past has been really um, one of the strongest criticisms to this modality of screen has really been the fact that it, it really requires um, strong uh, investment and uh, um, strong commitment in terms of resources to um, to, to um, uh, complete a campaign end to end uh, due to the long deconvolution times. Um, together with, um, I guess, more traditional uh, phenotypic based drug discovery, we have invested also in different modality of, of screening. You see the genome wide CRISPR platform um, and the secretome uh, uh, screening. These are really two investments that we have made um, specifically into genetic screening uh, with, the, um, with the implementation of genome wide arrayed um, CRISPR screening. Um, and I will provide an example in this presentation of this. And another collaboration that we have um, um, established with the, the, uh, with the, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm um, to get a hold uh, of the Secretum Library. This, this is, these are um, uh, the, 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 all, all the extracellular secreted protein uh, from, from human cells um, um, produced in, um, in a, in a, in a, I guess in a, with the level of your purity that allows us to um, apply screening methodology to understand what um, biology they trigger um, when applied to our models. Um, and as I mentioned before, although in this cartoon, this is only indicated with a, with a box, um, creation of disease relevant cellular models is really a central part of our strategy. We spend the majority of the time in our functional genomics campaign building the right models. Um, the screening uh, parts of it, whether it's a CRISPR screen or whether it's uh, or, um, another modality of screen, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not what takes the significant time. Um, another thing that takes significant time is obviously the, the deconvolution of the hit list, and we have invested um, uh, um, in, in, in teams that work very synergistically in AstraZeneca with, with functional genomics to build the capability to um, deconvolute um, hits coming from uh, from these um, from these uh, from these approaches, and we're building currently um, a number of capabilities that allow us then to validate target coming from this hit list using in silico, in vitro, and in vivo approaches. Um, as, as shown in this slide, the reason for, by, for which we, we run this functional genomic screening in AstraZeneca is obviously to identify novel targets. It is for target discovery, but I think there is a lot more in terms of um, uh, uh, delivery, if you want, to the scientific community that this campaign can do, because uh, they, they can really elucidate new biology, they'll, they'll, they, they um, uh, represent a um, good opportunity from, from, um, from, um, from a publication point of view. Um, there are a number of pathways uh, that are either relevant or not relevant for human disease that one can interrogate using, using the to these tools. And as mentioned specifically in the oncology space with pool CRISPR screening, the really um, important in delivering information for drug discovery projects that have been um, strongly linked to success um, uh, uh, of this project from a clinical point of view. Combination therapies, for example, and patient stratification hypothesis, going back to the, to the, the genetic link um, with the, uh, of, of targets to, the, to, a, to a given disease. So uh, I'll spend probably the next uh, um, uh, the next two or three minutes describing an, an example of the um, of a project that we have um, where we run um, a genome wide CRISPR screening. Before before doing that, I just wanted to spend 
one slide describing um, the workflow, if you want, the method that we have established um, that allows us to uh, make a decision on uh, um, uh, this is whatever models that we want to uh, build um, in line with a, with a given uh, disease segment where we want to generate new target hypothesis. Um, and all the steps that essentially lead us to the generation of the models, um, the screening of the model, um, the readout um, post screening, and uh, the data analysis. This, uh, this moment in AstraZeneca uh, within the functional genomics team is, is an end-to-end -end platform. This, this, this is a these, these capabilities are all integrated in, uh, um, in, in one platform. And this is really where I think we've seen a lot of, um, um, it's, I guess, an important angle uh, 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 when, when wanting to establish this, part, this platform. Um, the one bit that I want to highlight is the, the effort that we've done in, uh, in building these relevant models, because as I mentioned before, this is one of the key uh, points uh, that makes a good target. Um, having a, a model, translatable model that can be used for the discovery of the target, but, but also for the prose prosecution of the target. And um, we have um, uh, used a number of, um, well, we, we have used an internal proprietary um, approach um, uh, that allow us essentially to um, introduce Cas9 into these uh, uh, models in a way that doesn't change the biology of the models. Uh, once again, linking um, the, the, the for, for us, what is what is important is is that uh, whatever manipulation we do to the, to our model, we 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 don't change um, the biology of the model that and and and, and introduce I guess an, an artifactual um, angle into into the screening. To do so, we have used a technology called all in technology, where essentially Cas9 is under the um, control of a of a, a strong insulator, um, and so it can only be induced in presence of of, of doxycycline. When doxycycline is uh, is um, removed from the media where the, the models are, um, Cas9 disappears, um, essentially allowing um, the, the, um, the, the presence of Cas9 only to do what it needs to, to do, the, the, the genome editing of a, of a given gene in presence of a guide RNA, uh, um, but not um, leaving the time, I guess, to alter the biology. And another approach that we um, um, have recently put in place is um, to deliver Cas9 using an even more transient um, approach. So the delivery of Cas9 using mRNA or even protein. And the data that you see below in this slide shows that we can do that um, without compromising the robustness of our, our data. Um, the project example that um, I want to spend two minutes talking about is the um, example uh, um, shown in the next capital slide. Um, um, we, working with our coll colleagues in oncology, we um, generated a number of uh, um, a strong interest in, uh, in identifying factors that um, uh, alter the stability of androgen receptor. Androgen receptor being one of the key driver or the key driver for castration resistance uh, prostate cancer. Um, the hypothesis is that um, uh, the, the um, uh, at the moment in the therapy, anti-androgens um, have a, a, a limited use because um, a patient develop um, a resistance to anti-androgens, um, which is essentially a variants of the androgen receptor that lack the androgen binding domain and therefore um, are insensitive to this, to this approach. Uh, and the hypothesis is that if we instead can identify uh, genes that regulate the stability of androgen receptor, epigenetically or not epigenetically, um, that could be um, a, a different approach that could circumvent the, 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 um, the, 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 the mechanism of resistance. So what we have done, we have um, built a, a number of cancer models, um, 2D cancer models, um, uh, prostate cancer cell line that express Cas9 using the methodology that I showed before. We have characterized those models. Um, and when I say, and, and spend a lot of time characterizing these models, this seems, the reason why I focus on this is because um, because I think it's, it's very important to, 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 to deliver the message that um, we believe uh, we have screened um, relevant biology 
um, these models are responsive to the 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 the, the compounds that it is supposed to be responding to, based on um, on the expression of the relevant androgen receptor variant, um, and in 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 and, and everything checks out in terms of uh, um, their biology, their transcriptome profile, um, in presence of Cas9 um, or in absence of of Cas9. We have applied, um, um, in terms of perturbation mortality, genome-wide CRISPR-N and CRISPR-A RAID library. I didn't spend time uh, diversifying, I guess, the concept of uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, perturbation modality that one can have with CRISPR. CRISPR-N is the ability to generate uh, uh, a gene knockout, um, while CRISPR-A is the ability to upregulate genes uh, in, uh, in an arrayed um, um, uh, format. Um, and lastly, we have built a high content biology assay that allows us to not only stain for androgen receptor, um, uh, but also to stain for, um, for proliferation and for one of the key target genes of androgen receptor, FKBP5. Um, and this is uh, an example, I guess, of the screening results that we have um, uh, uh, generated. Uh, once again, genome-wide array CRISPR end screen. What you see on in this graph um, on the y-axis is, is androgen receptor intensity. Uh, the black dots are uh, genes that, when knocked out, do not alter the stability of androgen receptor. The blue dots are um, is, are in trade positive controls. So those are guide RNA that target specific the androgen receptor gene. So where you would uh, essentially um, expect um, uh, abolishment of, of the signal. Everything that you see in the middle, I don't know if you can see it in this slide, are essentially genes that have somewhat, when knocked out, have somewhat altered the, the expression of, of androgen receptor. Um, when we look at the identity of these genes, we find um, non-regulator of androgen receptor, but also things that we wouldn't, um, that we wouldn't expect. Um, and at the moment, we are validating this hit list. And, uh, and, and I guess for me, this is a strong um, ex well, ex an example of how we in functional genomics, through target discovery platform, through establishment of disease relevant models and complementation with an integration with screening, uh, with genetic screening, can um, 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 have an opportunity to impact uh, the, the company's portfolio. This is the summary. Um, um, hopefully, um, the, um, it is clear that uh, um, um, from, from, I guess, an industry perspective, the establishment of an effective target discovery platform is important to reduce the clinical attrition rate. This is why it is important. Um, what makes a good tar grad target from, from our point of view is the genetic linkage to the disease, but also the availability of translatable models. And so we have used these two guiding principles in the establishment of of our internal platform and also in, in, in talking and approaching our external collaborators. And I've shown one example that I believe um, um, shows, I guess, the, the, the strong opportunities that we have in this, in this uh, space um, to identify better targets um, that have a better chance to make it through the, the clinical development. Um, one second, just to acknowledge a large group of people that have contributed to the establishment of the platform and also to the various investments um, that come into functional genomics throughout the years. Um, um, and as I mentioned before, we're acu acutely aware of the fact that uh, in this space we won't win alone and it's uh, pointless to build um, uh, a capability in isolation. So if you have ideas to work with us, uh, um, um, we, we're, we're very open, we're very fortunate in this space. We can, uh, um, we have a number of platforms to interact with, uh, with, uh, with groups uh, that are interested in either um, uh, working with our tools or working with the data that we generate in genome wide rate critical screening. If you're interested in knowing more about this, um, um, have a look at the Open Innovation Portal. And with this, I want to thank everyone for the kind attention and I'm happy to take questions. I can figure it out how. Uh, let me see. So, are there other ways to ID a target other than genetics? Are some disease uh, uh, some disease not always genetically driven? At absolutely a good point. Um, 
um, I didn't have the time to uh, to to describe this in, in more detail, um, but we're also um, looking at our modality of screening using the secretome screen, which is now the genetic screen, and it's protein driven, uh, small molecule based, um, you'd either using um, phenotypic sets or using um, uh, fragments. Um, it, it, it is genetic screening is not the only way um, for us to identify novel targets, although I have to say, um, having the, the strong link with genetics um, is, uh, is, um, is something that uh, um, guides our, uh, uh, our thinking. Um, and then there is another question, chemoproteomics is a labor intensive method to identify the targets of phenotypically active small molecule. I was wondering how often you use this strategy and how do you decide when to use this approach? Um, it's really dependent on um, on the the modality of screening that we that we decide to apply in um, when using any sort of compounds, these small molecule fragments, chemoproteomic becomes the way to the convolute. Um, um, it's um, it obviously not it's, it's not applied um, to CRISPR uh, screening or to secretome screening, where um, where in theory you will have the identity of your targets. From, from the primary screen because you know exactly what the gene is that has, has modulated your, your phenotype, which I think is one of the unique selling points of a CRISPR screen. Um, and I'll take maybe one last one, last minute. Are you implementing 3D models with your um, discovery platform? Excellent point. Um, I think there is still a long way to go. Um, we are acutely aware, as I mentioned, that. Uh, um, more complex model, whether these are 3D models, whether these are ID, uh, whether these are um, co-culture or microphysiological system, it's uh, it's uh, it's the way to go. Um, we are we're investing. Um, we're we're trying to, to understand what what is the the I guess the next step um, for us. And probably before looking at 3D models, which we can absolutely use when it's feasible from a screening perspective, um, the next step for um, uh, we, we've, we've started to generate very um, interesting data using uh, um, CRISPR screening in co-culture system um, of immune cells and cancer cells to identify novel targets um, and that are relevant for immune oncology. We have a paper that will be um, uh, uh, soon published uh, um, summarizing these results um, that hopefully describes some of our things and how we're trying to move away from, from 2D culture. And this is it, I think. Um, I think next uh, uh, in the agenda is John. Thank you very much. Hopefully people can um, uh, can hear me and I'm just going to take over the screen sharing and uh, there we go. So the in the next um, in the next session um, I'll talk uh, a little bit about the, some of the general principles of historical drug targets what that may mean for the future um, and um, highlight some of the data, the important data resources online that give evidence to support the triage and prioritization of, uh, of, uh, of targets. So this, this concept of drug ability is, is, is quite a sort of elusive one. It's reasonably widely um, adopted and used within the within the industry and the um, uh, the uh, in order for a drug target to become a genuine drug target it needs two two components there needs to be a site that a pharmaceutical can can latch on to um, a druggable site uh, for small molecules of course the druggable site is quite different to a, uh, a monoclonal antibody the shape and topology features of the surface are very different for different therapeutic modalities and the second uh, component of a druggable target is a link to a usable or exploitable causal link to the disease process, this efficacy. And historical drug targets have, have got this, both of these components. They're efficacious and also they've got a druggable site. Um, an example of, of a protein with a druggable site um, uh, that uh, 
probably will never make a good drug target is something like serum albumin. It binds a lot of drugs, but, but binding to serum albumin doesn't seem to do a lot, um, uh, uh, a lot um, uh, phenotypically. Um, and conversely, there's a lot of targets, tantalizing targets, for which there's very good, very strong genetic evidence um, that there is a, a causal relationship to the disease process. Um, but so far, people have been unable to develop small molecule or protein biologicals or, or interference RNA, whatever, um, therapeutics to, uh, towards them. And this talk, I, I guess, is a bit of a sort of navigation of these two components, this sort of druggability um, and also this, um, uh, this efficacy component. So what are the historical drug targets? Um, the, uh, my group and, and a number of collaborators have published a couple of reviews, and, and of course there's, there's much more published work out there. But the bottom line is the, the drug genome is a lot smaller than we, uh, than we think, in the order of, say, three, 400 human targets um, for about 15 or 1,600 approved drugs. And that's out of... Um, a total genome size of about 19 or 20,000 um, uh, genes. So either there's great opportunity in exploiting and developing drugs against new members of the, the new, uh, un currently are drug members of the, the genome, or there may well be a, a, a sort of restriction or um, a focusing of the opportunities within particular um, target classes. So, so because um, I think are both um, both open access, um, you, you'd be able to um, get them later. And um, for those of you really interested, um, I, I've got um, some a, a box full of uh, full of the, the poster, uh, which looks remarkably nice on your, your um, uh, confinement or home isolation um, office wall. So so if people mail Dan afterwards, I'll I'll, I'll arrange somehow um, to get uh, copies of this poster. Uh, ship to you. So of course there's different types of drugs and different types of drugs can target different um, targets within the body. So monoclonal antibody drugs to a good first approximation are extracellular or extracellular exposed targets. You can't really get it get to a cytosolic target inside the brain with a monoclonal antibody. So there's a there's a sort of flaw um, to how many targets could be targeted with monoclonal um, antibodies. And it also turns out, looking at empirical evidence, that there's a similar sort of flaw um, or accessible space for small molecule um, uh, protein targets as well. So this is an analysis of, of, of several years ago now. Um, of uh, drugs approved uh, in this particular year, um, around about three quarters were small molecules, uh, and the, the majority of the small molecules were um, uh, synthetic uh, molecules as opposed to semi-synthetic or natural product uh, derived chemotypes. Um, to give you an idea of drugs deeper in the development pipeline, so these would have typically been things in phase 2B, phase 3. On the right hand side um, on this uh, signed USAN set, uh, you can see a larger fraction of monoclonal antibodies, almost one in five um, uh, drugs at that stage were uh, were protein therapeutics, or, or more than one in five um, in, in aggregate, um, but fewer of those have made it through, or, or on this time scale, have made it through to the to the marketplace. So the majority of drug discovery um, is still um, in uh, the, or in, in terms of novel drugs, is still in the small molecule arena. Although increasingly, cell-based therapies, um, uh, uh, gene therapies. Um, and, and biologicals um, are, are clearly having uh, coming to the coming to the fore. A few years ago, we updated um, the the analysis that we originally published in the mid two thousands, and this really sort of reaffirmed the view that there was um, a relatively small set of privileged targets or privileged target families within the genome, and this was further reinforced by the fact that for orphan drugs, not not orphan drugs in the regulatory sense but orphan drugs in the sense that we didn't know their target at the time of the first analysis, um, and molecular biology techniques and, and chemoproteomics and so forth had found the target, that in fact um, they fell into these same families. So GPCR, um, some drugs were, were unknown to be GPCR ligands, uh, but actually this GPCR nature of their, 
the molecular effect of target was uh, subsequently, uh, subsequently established. So um, here's a, a, a map of the trends of drug approval over time against um, particular therapeutic areas. Um, most recently, it, it's really been a, a sort of rebirth of um, focused areas of anti-infective research, uh, research. So in the bottom, um, uh, towards the bottom, uh, just on the right-hand side, this uh, J segment, which is direct acting um, anti-infective agents, um, the, the HCV drugs, or, or the relatively large number of HCV targeted agents has, has really provided you know, very good addressed um, uh, therapeutic opportunity and patient benefit. The other area, of course, has been um, huge development in um, anti-cancer agents but, and, and immunosuppressants, this L, um, uh, this L range um, of the uh, uh, of this diagram, and for a little bit of context, uh, this the, the organisation scheme used here is the WHO ATC scheme, so the Anatomic Therapeutic Chemical Classification Scheme, which is a, a lovely sort of um, Dewey Decimal Classification System equivalent, but for drugs. It, it places drugs into particular therapeutic classes, um, and it's a very convenient way to analyse drug action. Um, to think about opportunities of drug repositioning, which is finding a new application of a drug uh, in a new therapeutic setting um, and so forth. But, but this, um, this graph and the data behind it in, in, is, is available in the supplementary data of this publication. Now moving to the, the, the sort of the privileged um, drug target classes. So these are the sort of things that if you do a, a GWAS study or uh, um, a sort of um, a pull down or knockouts or, or whatever, these features of targets would be the things, these properties of targets would be the sort of things that, that naturally raise interest um, and further analysis. So being an enzyme is a particularly privileged um, uh, component. So proteases, 4% uh, of, of drug targets are proteases. Um, and it turns out that within the proteases that not all proteases are, are um, uh, created equally. So exopeptidases, so proteases that cleave the N and the C termini of um, peptides or proteins are more successful um, uh, historically than those that cleave within inside a, uh, with inside a peptide chain. Um, and then when we look at the known structures of those targets, where we have the 3D structure, we can see some clear differences in the patterns of, of substrate recognition and the, and the sort of shape and the properties of the cavities. So a very productive way of, of doing target prioritization is if you have a known structure to profile and examine the cavities on the surface of the protein. And what you're looking for is a, it's a little bit like a Goldilocks pocket, not too big, not too small. If it's too big, you need a large therapeutic uh, to fill it, to get maximal ligand efficiency in the pocket. Um, and it's likely to lead to a chemotype or a drug with poor PK and fast clearance. Um, not too small. If it's too small, uh, you're unlikely to get the potency you require within a drug because you need a, a set number of interactions um, to, in order to get the potency, to get um, typical drug-like potency. Not too lipophilic, not too polar. If it's too polar, it's likely to stay in the gut as a small molecule. If it's too lipophilic, it's likely just to partition um, into the, uh, the lipid phase of the body and or be cleared very quickly. So, so choosing the right um, target or the, choosing the right properties of the target and the binding site is very informative in, in revealing it. Um, other privileged classes are, are ion channels, membrane receptors, and, and so forth. Transcription factors are pretty tough. Um, uh, and protein-protein interactions are pretty tough for small molecules. Protein-protein interactions are, uh, are relatively straightforwardly accessible um, using protein biologics, but then they need to be um, exposed to the sort of compartments in the body, primarily the serum, where um, a, an injected biological or a, a, you know, another form of, of uh, delivery could, uh, could actually allow target engagement. So historical drug ability runs in families. So drug targets of the past, to um, a good extent, are, are focused in a, a relatively small number of, of, um, 
families. On the left-hand side of this slide, what we have is uh, a breakdown of, of essentially the pooled industry medicinal chemistry efforts as captured in the Kemble database. So 18% of all of the Kemble contents uh, at a compound level are um, GPCR ligands, that's that blue 18% portion. On the right-hand side, it's showing that of launched drugs, 30% um, are GPCR um, drugs of the compounds contained in, in Kemble. And so some families are, are, are overrepresented here, which represents a good yield on the discovery investment. But for the purposes of this talk, just on the, on the, uh, the left-hand side, you can see this large 40-odd percent um, sort of non-family or non um, uh, or, or non-significantly sized family membership, and and this is you know, very underrepresented in the success or the approval rate of of new drugs. So although it's often very tempting to look for novel targets that haven't been drugged before, it certainly takes a lot more time to break the back, um, and your your um, uh, discovery productivity will be a lot lower. Um, for targets of uh, the for novel targets, so four families really do explain the majority of historical pharmacology: rhizopsin like GPCRs, ion channels, nuclear receptors, and protein kinases. So fifty three percent of all historical targets, and about seventy percent of drugs modulate one of these four um, target classes. So. Investing time and in, in, in screening technologies, in compound libraries, um, and in expertise around the system, systems biology and signaling of these proteins is you know, a very common theme for a large number of, of platform-based um, discovery uh, type strategies. And we'll come on to a great project um, a little bit later that's being funded by the NIH Illuminating the Druggable Genome that really tries and fills in details around some of these privileged families because the likelihood is if you find some interesting disease biology behind them it will be quite tractable um, uh, in, in terms of or relatively tractable drug discovery is never easy trust me um, uh, to find or, or develop a, a drug so this is just a distribution of the molecular targets of current drugs at a, at a domain level or a family level um, and there is this sort of long tail distribution. So HMG CoA reductase is in the, in, in the uh, sort of single member family, um, arguably the most commercially successful um, drug target in history. But you can't really find, well, there aren't HMG CoA reductase um, homologs or relatives that you can exploit that chemistry and structural biology knowledge against. Whereas for GPCRs, there is now a large number, 70 odd. Um, 3D uh, distinct um, X-ray structures known of, uh, of this family, and a very high fraction of those, uh, or relatively high fraction of that family, has turned into being in the past a, a good drug target. So on the next slide, what we're doing is we're looking at the domains within the human genomes. This, the first slide was looking at historical drug targets. This is now the corresponding um, equivalent gra graph for the entire genome. And there are many, many domains or, or many, many structural families within the genome which have been there in plain sight. They could have been the targets of drugs developed in phenotypic screens and so forth, but they've been consistently unsuccessful or, or they've never really transitioned across into being um, a good drug target. And the reality is that there aren't any very large families which could or are likely to be the basis of a, a large set of um, future drugs. So the, the domains, or, or the, you know, as we know about the structural biology of these, they look pretty tough things to target with a small molecule. Of course, new technologies can come along, um, ProTac and so forth that could open them up, but for a classical small molecule approach, they're gonna be very, very tough targets or, or families to crack. A nice example of this family-based approach is the protein kinase family, the, the kinome. Um, and at the moment, there's, there's you know, well, approaching a thousand, there's 821 clinical stage um, human kinase inhibitors. So these are small molecule drugs targeting the protein um, uh, kinase catalytic domain. And there's now 71 approved 
small molecule protein kinase inhibitors. Um, so we maintain a, a list, we built an informatic system that, that just sweeps the internet, um, gathers these up and, and curates data around them. Um, and the interesting thing is that the coverage of this family within other resources, um, so the KEG database, Drug Central, Guide to Pharmacology and so forth, um, the, you know, there's, there's relatively incomplete um, coverage of clinical stage compounds. And, and the, it's certainly worth, if you're interested in, in tracking um, uh, compound de uh, development in the clinic, you, you, you've got to trace or track a lot of sources to get the best, the best picture. But, but the graphs on the right-hand side really do show, I, I think, a really interesting, really interesting trend. Um, so there were very few drugs that protein kinase until um, the the opportunity that for the family and, and our understanding in uh, the the sort of the the analysis of the human genome um, signaling pathways and drugs that targeted this ATP binding site really did start to show that this was a tractable druggable family. And when you go back and look at historical drugs, drugs from the 1960s and 70s, some of those may well, we, we've got some quite nice evidence that we're in the process of, of writing up for publication, that some of those old drugs actually targeted kinases before we knew there were kinases there, if, if you see what I mean. But you can really see now that the, the, the industry is motoring in the, product, in the production of compounds that get to phase 2B, um, phase 3, so that's in, in a bottom panel, um, uh, you are using as a proxy for phase two uh, B in, in this phase, the assignment of a, uh, a non-proprietary name. Um, and you can see almost 300 uh, compounds in that, uh, in that phase, very rapid growth and continuing growth. Um, and for drug approvals, again, yeah, very rapid takeoff um, as people started to work on this clearly druggable and exploitable family. The challenge there was putting the role of the genes into particular biological or, or disease relevant pathways. Um, we've heard about genetics uh, a little bit. One of, um, one of uh, my favorite um, uh, diseases, to uh, one, one of my favorite ways to address this efficacy component is through uh, a technique called Mendelian randomization, uh, which is a, a sort of clinical trial turned on its head. That's the way I see it. So on the left-hand side, normally, um, what you do in a clinical trial is you give a drug to two um, populations um, or you give, um, at random, but to um, a population of, of disease, um, a, a disease cohort or clinical trial cohort. Um, and for one part of the arm, you don't give a drug at all. Um, so the idea is the drug perturbs, perturbs the target gene or the target mechanism in some way. And between the two arms, uh, of this trial, the, the drug treated and the placebo, you look for a difference in, in outcome. And that, and that really is the gold standard um, uh, used uh, for um, uh, drug approvals. Mendelian randomization is really turning this on its head and treating the natural population variation of a, um, of a, a target, so exploiting the, the natural you know, random um, differences in, in the gene and the slight perturbations that has on its its function um, and then looking for those same um, health outcomes um, but using a, a genetic tool or a genetic variant um, as a way of measuring that so typically for small effect sizes of you need very large patient populations you need good genotyping but we're now approaching a time where I think we can start to use genetics in this Mendelian randomization um, sort of paradigm as a way of, of preempting or pre-scoring the likely success of, of a target prior to this really expensive phase two um, study um, that, 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 that does the efficacy, uh, that, that really proves the efficacy. So I think these, these genetic um, methods um, and, and very good phenotyping data are gonna be quite transformative in pre-validating um, or de-risking um, the success of these um, of these targets and th there's many other applications of this Mendelian randomization approach as well so whether a, um, a side effect of a drug is on target or off target really nice um, example in, in torcetrabib um, uh, uh, one of the well the first CETP inhibitor cholesterol transfer protein 
inhibitors where there was a, a, a blood pressure side effect of the drug and genetics in that case pretty definitively showed that the um, that was a compound specific effect so an off target effect of the compound not due to CETP itself. So we've recently published um, some opportunities of using um, uh, large scale mendelian randomization and, and healthcare data um, for drug repurposing, uh, but there's many other applications of it as, uh, as well. So in the last few moments, um, I better whiz through this, uh, apologize for taking a few, few moments longer than I intended. Um, some key online resources that, that I refer to all the time um, when I'm looking at drug targets or considering drug targets for analysis, triage, and, and so forth. Um, so the first one is targets, um, a collaborative um, uh, project um, between a number of industry partners, the EBI uh, and the Sanger Institute. Yeah, really, really good collection of, uh, of data there. Um, here, you know, we're just looking at a particular page for base one, where it turns out there's actually relatively little support in the literature and genetics for Alzheimer's, despite the fact that it was seen as one of the most promising Alzheimer's targets. Um, and, and so, you know, if you really believed this data, you probably could have made a different um, investment decision or, or project choice um, uh, around base one. Um, I've mentioned this illuminating the druggable genome at all. This is a, uh, a global uh, project with, with the majority of ac uh, activity within the states, where I guess for the undrugged members, the currently undrugged members of some of these privileged families, they're trying to fill in the, the gaps around the biology, trying to find links between these these novel targets and um, a particular disease pathology. Um, some great classifications as to whether there's a chemical tool known, a biological to tool known, and so forth for these. Um, and it, it's um, yeah, it, it's back, it's a lovely resource. Um, the resources so far, I, I merely see them as being uh, related to germline diseases. So, that, so these are diseases, not all, as we know, not all diseases are genetic, um, uh, but some diseases certainly are, and there's some risk factors baked into your germline genome. Other diseases, um, like uh, cancer, or primarily cancer, are somatic. So they're, they're, they're caused by, or a large fraction of them are caused by mutations that happen post-birth. And, and different target properties um, and, and different assays and different validation technologies are needed in these germline diseases um, versus these, these somatic diseases. And the cancer um, platform at the ICR is, is very good and very focused on these somatic diseases, in particular um, cancer. Acknowledgements, really like to, to thank a PhD student of mine when I was at the EBI, Rita Santos now at GSK, Arun at UCL, uh, Bisan uh, at the Institute of Cancer Research and, and Tudor Apriya at uh, UNM. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Do you want to look at the questions, John? Uh, just trying to work out how to... Uh, how to uh, how to do that? Ooh. Just head down to the bottom of the screen, John, onto that Q and A box. It's got um, it's got a couple of questions in there for you at the bottom of the screen. Ah. Okay, Q and A, brilliant. Um, so, first question is: Do you think recycling drugs can slow down the discovery of new drugs? Um, the uh, I, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I, I think we've all seen this this huge effort gone into into repositioning of drugs for, um, for uh, 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 COVID, um, you know, SARS-2, whatever. Um, the, there'll be new therapies from that, I'm sure. There'll, there'll be a, a lot of patient benefit. Um, the, you know, it, it does take a lot of, of investment to, to, to break the back of a new target, um, new target class or, or family. Um, uh, so, uh, next one is, is um, uh, Mendelian randomization. Um, so, that just trying to, to read this live. Um, yeah, so, so actually, um, the, 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 the data show that with sufficient power, GWAS is um, a pretty good at uh, finding and validating 
drug target. So there's a difference between, I guess, a classical GWAS view um, and um, uh, a particular Mendelian randomization construct. And to be honest, you know, I'm primarily a chemical informatician and my collaborators are the experts in that in particular, Arun. Uh, but it's certainly the case that early GWAS you know, didn't have the right power and scale to inform good drug target choice. Now, um, you can do a good job of finding um, uh, uh, activities or pharmacological activities via uh, GWAS type genetic variation studies. But again, you need very good phenotyping um, to really get to the bottom of, uh, uh, of, of that. Um, based on experience, what do you think and, and can expect about Protac uh, Chimeras? Um, I think, um, well, it's, it's not an area I've got, um, I've got a lot of, a lot of ex direct experience in myself. It is fascinating though. It is, I, I think it's a really, really nice um, uh, approach. I, I think there's gonna be, you know, quite a lot of gotchas um, as agents go through the, um, through the clinic. Um, you know, and, and even I, I guess the, the, to my reading, you know, the, the, um, the, the sort of cerebron um, sort of story and, uh, and so forth. Yeah, it, it, it is, it, it's, it's difficult to understand how some of those drugs actually work, or at least it is to, um, is to me. Um, other plots you shared, such as the kinase drug landscape viewable through the MDC webpage or elsewhere. Uh, so the short answer is no. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to sort of, um, you know, analyze data or, or provide views and, and so forth. But, but one of the things that we're at the MDC, um, you know, we're not um, a data repository and, and resource system. We analyze data, we try and, and do learning on top of it for um, both translational academics and, and, and um, small companies. You know, we're not trying to replace in any way the excellent high quality public domain resources that are, uh, that are out there. Um, Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, John. And I think we're absolutely spot on time there. Um, if you want to just stop screening your um, oh. screen there, John, and then I can... Shit, sorry. That's okay. And then I can just show what we're, we're going to look at next week. So, well, th first of all, thanks very much to David and John for kicking off the MDC Connects webinar series with those two um, perspectives on uh, target identification. For next week, we're moving on to HIT identification and we've got three talks. We're starting out with HIT ID screening, understanding your target is key, and that will be by Trevor Asquith at Domain X. And then Gary Allen B from Aurelia Bioscience will take us through cell-based screening, old dogs with new tricks. And Andrew Panifer at Medicines Discovery Catapult will be talking about targeted compound libraries. Um, so thank you to everyone that's joined us today and we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>